Uh, friends, today I would like to talk to you in English. The theme is science and freedom. This is the lockdown period in India and in most of the countries in the world. And uh, I want people sitting at home to do some introspection of their actions and their thought process. I would like to talk to you about three issues, scientific inquiry, freedom, and internal strife and non-violence. Well, I would like to begin with three bas two basic human principles. Number one, that one must feel responsible for one's actions. If they cause harm to others, one must refrain from them. This is common to common teaching of all religions, all philosophies of the world. And second is that self, assertion of self is a bondage and one must liberate oneself from this arrogance of self. Regarding scientific inquiry, I'd like to mention a few things. Well, all scientific research is an exploration for truth. So truth is the ultimate objective. For this you make observations, you draw inferences from them, formulate certain principles or laws, then continue experimentation and so on. So science is a process of evolution and exploration for truth is the goal and uh, one's personality should not come in the path of observation, in the way of process of observation. Second thing is that all scientific research is essentially to explore the relationship between cause and effect. So this should never be forgotten. And third is science is a common endeavor of human race. In 1976, Abdul Salam, who got Nobel Prize uh, a year before, was invited to the University of Maryland. In the beginning of his talk, he began his talk with an anecdote that in 12th century, Afghan traveler Al Baruni came to India and he noted that the science in India was substantially advanced. Then he cited two examples, science in China and science in Egypt were also quite advanced. So at that time, the focus or the central focal point of science was these countries. Later on, it shifted to Europe and these days it has shifted to United States of America. Then he pointed out that one should not believe that science is a monopoly of particular race or particular nation. I would add one thing more. Scientists cannot function if they are not fed by the farmers, if they are not closed by the weavers, and if they are not taught by the teachers and academic institutions are not there. Even Einstein or Newton would not be able to work if there were no institutions. And in this entire process of eating, clothing, teaching, you are a part of the bigger society. So it's a common endeavor, not only of scientists, but of the society as a whole. And if we realize this, then I think our vanity, our ego will substantially melt. And then probably our observations will be much deeper and our involvement will be much deeper. And this is the basic message of Indian civilization or civilization of all the countries of the world which had evolved through agrarian societies, agrarian or uh, small scale industry economies. This is a common feature of all civilizations. Then I like to quantify freedom. I would like to specifically talk about freedom from prejudice, freedom from dominance or slavery, and freedom from exploitation. Well, prejudice is a very severe disease, not only about others that we get carried away by the notions or the tags attached to a person 
tag of religion, tag of caste, tag of race or nation. But we also carry images of our, about our own selves. We would like to project our selves which we are not. And this element of prejudice is crippling. It shuts off your creativity and it's a bondage. So let's inquire whether science has been helping overcome prejudice or it's increasing prejudice. Well, forget about personal prejudice. There is an organized prejudice also. The organized prejudice becomes sectarianism. It becomes fascism, Nazism. That is all organized prejudice about certain communities, about certain people. And science, unfortunately, has not been very effective in countering such prejudices. I would like to explore a little more. You know, I would consider the modern science to start with Newton's laws of motion, which is around 1700 that these laws was formulated by Newton just prior to 1700 AD. And uh, in 1776, James Watt invented the steam engine. And then big industries or big mills started coming up. First, they started in Europe, uh, in England, then in Italy, Germany, and other European countries, and so on. Now, there are four requirements, as I mentioned earlier also, of these industries that they require iron to make factories, they require fuel to run factories and they require raw material for the manufacturing and then the finished products so they require markets for finished products these are four requirements for these the industrialized nations looked for towards in european towards african countries and asian countries and they enslaved them for enslavement, they required weapons. Scientists helped them produce devastating weapons. Then the scientists did not raise a finger, a voice of concern. When the factories or machines built by them and the warfare or the armaments built by them were used to enslave nations, scientists kept quiet. I think they violated the basic principle of humanism. And uh, it's, I said, let's not put allegations on ancient scientists. I'm talking about scientists today. All of us, many of us, especially the ones settled in the United States and other developed countries, are working for science directly or indirectly. And still, this process is continuing. Look at Congo. Congo is a country in Africa which produces tentatum. About 75% needs of the world are fulfilled from Congo. And Congo is one of the poorest countries in the world. And what is tantalum doing? Tantalum is the one of the major materials for manufacturing of chips in computers and cell phones. So I think when we use cell phones, when we are using computers, we must also think about the people of that region who are starving. Congo has been the victim of sectarian or racial violence also. About 3.5 million people died there. And who did it? The weapons did it. The states did it, who controlled the authority. So I think scientists must not think just in terms of their present employer, that if they are serving their present employer, then they are honest. If they are honest to the employer, then they are honest to the mankind. It's not true. I think surely one should not be a cheat. You should not cheat your employer or your government, but you should be open-minded and see beyond the narrow territories. So this is something I wanted to bring to your attention. And uh, Third thing was freedom from exploitation. Big machines K 
came bringing big hopes that we will wipe out hunger, we will wipe out scarcity, and in, 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 in some, ex to some extent they succeeded in it. But for the third world countries, Asian countries and African countries, the first 100 years after the invention of steam engine, or maybe 150 years, but the years of devastation, famine in India in 1980, in 1898, a big famine took place in India because the indigenous industry was closed by the arrival of big industry and imperial power, and that led to killing of about 1.4 million, uh, 14 million people, 1.4 crore people. They died of starvation in a famine in that period, in, in that year. So what I wanted to bring to your attention that science has this dark feature. But dark science is a very bright feature also. The feature is that science helped expansion of education, collaboration with different scientific collaboration and educational collaboration with other countries. And that brought democracy in the world. Education, wherever you expand education, it always brings more openness, more transparency, communication. So all freedom movements in the later part of in the 20th century were led essentially were helped by the evolution of science, one thing more, when science invented a small motor, a small machine, just like a power loom as compared to a big textile mill, it broadened the base of production, it employed more people and it became less monopolistic. So I think what we need to do now, I would urge my friends in big labs and universities to focus their attention on two things. Number one, develop a small machine, help the growth of decentralized economies, job-oriented growth, and also please has never be a part of sinister propaganda of prejudice which is going on in many third world countries, including our own country, India. And the NRI settled abroad have a responsibility to refrain from supporting sectarian moves, prejudices. All prejudices, whether it's on the basis of race, religion, nation, or anything else, is terrible, is inhuman and we must refrain from it. I hope the friends sitting in different countries, be they are Indians or non-Indians, I have been to many countries and I found an element of affection all over. And that must grow deeper and deeper. And I think we can make a better world. Thank you very much.